Great. So next, uh, we're going to call back up Mandy Whaley. So, uh, you know, you've seen a little bit about her throughout this. Uh, Mandy's awesome. So she's on my team, hired her in as our uh, director of developer experience. She manages our entire dev evangelist team, as well as what we call the sandbox. The sandbox is if you're kind of coding on top of some of our products, you want a running version of those products without necessarily having to go out and buy a router to do network automation on routers. So we have the routers in our sandbox. Um, so there's so much that she's done. She's a teacher at heart. So she was actually teaching in um, college before that. Uh, and then she's also been teaching software to all of our CCIEs, uh, to our Cisco certified internet engineers out around the world, to our SEs. Uh, so she's really brought together software together with infrastructure and applications. Um, and then she has a really interesting talk that she's given on um, the power of data ops for women in tech. Um, well, I'll just let you judge for yourself, but super important message for all of us, not just for dads, not just for women, so for all of us. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, thank you. Can I get um, 12 minutes on the clock? I know we're trying to catch up, and I'm gonna do this lightning style um, quick. I've, I've done it as a five minute lightning talk before, so we'll see how I go. So um, this, this is a talk, uh, it's the power of dad ops for women in tech. And of, of course, it's, it's really family ops. I love the dad ops. Um, hashtag. If you haven't ever looked it up, give it a look. Uh, but it's, you know, dads who are active a lot of times in the DevOps community and things that they're doing with their family. And it's really the DevOps community, actually DevOps Days, I'll give a shout out to Damon and that community, who inspired me to, to give this talk because it was through conversations with that, that community that it came together. So this is about things that um, dads, uncles, neighbors, teachers, moms, aunts, family in the very broadest sense can do to um, help increase the number of women making it into STEM careers and into STEM technology. And um, so I'm going to dive in. So I started thinking that I, I really want to talk about women in technology, and I want to do it for a couple reasons. One is that I want to do it for my company, because I think that diverse teams are better at solving problems. I want to do it for all the amazing women on my team who are finding their way in their career. Um, and I want to do it for these crazy kiddos. So I have two sons, um, I have four nieces, and um, I want tech and STEM to be a really diverse and exciting place when they, when they get there. Um, so it, it's, it's partially for them. But when I start to think about talking about women in tech, I, I don't ever do it. Um, I get blocked by all of these topics. I think it's so big, it's so complicated, I'm gonna leave that to the experts to talk about. Or maybe it's, it's a little too close, a little too personal. Um, I think it'd be more fun to talk about containers and pythons and API, <laughs> which is what I normally talk about. And I'm a lot more comfortable talking about that. Um, it feels like a minefield. I'm probably going to unintentionally offend someone. Uh, so many pieces. Where do I start? I, I'm a developer. I don't know anything about these kinds of problems. Why would I talk about it? And then what assumptions will people make about me when, when I do talk about it? So, one night I was explaining all this to my husband about how I had all these reasons why I wasn't going to talk about it and that was probably the really smart thing to do. And he looked at me, he's really good at challenging me, and he said, I think you're being kind of lazy. And I was like, oh. And he was like, if that was a technical problem, if that was a business problem or a technology you wanted to learn, none of those things would stop you. He said, you are a woman in technology. You have two engineering degrees. You've worked in a number of different engineering fields and all. You found your way to software development and you love it. If you're not going to talk about it, who is going to talk about it? And he was right. And it was so annoying. I was like, oh, it's, it's true. So I decided to give it a, 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 a try. And I'm figuring out how to talk about it. So I really would want your feedback. I'm trying to learn and iterate and figure out how, how to have this conversation. And so this is um, based on my personal story. It's certainly not scientific. But I think giving these stories um, you know, is helpful. So who in the audience is a dad or an uncle? Awesome. Who has maybe a neighbor or a, 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 you know, a daughter or a son or anyone that they feel like is interested in STEM and you're kind of interested in, in shepherding and building that, that fire within them? Yeah, awesome. So that's why I give this talk, because um, it's usually the case that the audience has quite a few people having those thoughts. So all of you have some special powers. There was a great study that found that 68% of girls who are interested in STEM had a father or a male champion who encouraged them to go into STEM. And fathers and other male champions of change are key factors in the participation of girls and women in STEM fields. And I thought this was really interesting 
But then I kept reading it, and something was bothering me, and I thought, encourage. Encourage is kind of a fuzzy word. What, it, what does that mean? Encourage how? What, you just encourage someone? That's really enough? I don't think so. So I decided to think about what are some specific ways that dad ops and uncle ops and mom ops can do this encouragement? How can we make encourage more actionable? And so this comes down to some things that my dad did with me. So there's five of these. We'll go through them quick. The first one is develop an engineering mindset. So this is the idea of what we do in our jobs every day. Um, how often do you exactly know how something works, and you do it, and it works exactly that way? Never, right? That's not the way technology works. Um, and so the developing this mindset of you try something, it doesn't work, you learn, you iterate. This is the most important thing. You have to teach your kids to deal with the unknown. And I have dads ask me all the time, should I teach my daughter Python? Should we start in JavaScript? Is Scratch the right place to start? And I always tell them, the language doesn't matter, the technology doesn't matter, it's this mindset that matters. Like learning to um, have this engineering thought process is really the most important thing. And unfortunately right now, school doesn't teach this. School is predictable for the most part. Schools are doing more things that are more open-ended and teach some of this. But really, it's predictable rules and defined outcomes, which is not the world of technology in STEM. And so I think it's really important to try and build some of this technology uh, mindset at home. This is my dad. Uh, he's awesome. He's a lawyer, and then he also went back and became a doctor. And he's had a million hobbies. He is a serial hobbyist. He goes from one hobby to another and dives in very, very deep. Um, all these things, most recently, he's on ukuleles. He plays at ukulele. He, he goes and speaks at ukulele conferences. Did you know that was a thing? It is. <laughs> he's like on the ukulele concert circuit. Um, and uh, so he's when he was about maybe almost 70 or 60 something, he decided he wanted to make a website about ukuleles. And so he learned HTML and JavaScript and CSS when he was like 68-ish. And he built a website. It's kind of a weird looking website, but he did build it himself. And he interacts with people all over the world about ukuleles through his website. Um, and what's great about all these things that we did is that he gave me examples of learning something new. I knew that Yesterday, he didn't know anything about telescopes, and now we're in the middle of trying to build one, and it's kind of a huge disaster, but we're finding our way forward, and now we have a working telescope. And he always brought me into that learning. He did not let me sit on the sideline. It was, come over here and solder this wire. Help me do this thing. Now, I have to tell you that, that this was not always popular with me as a teenage girl or whatever. There were tears and resistance, but he persevered through, and it was just part of our, our family culture. And I think it has really um, led me down the path towards engineering. So show the fail when you're doing projects. <laughs> A lot of times, we just want to show the pretty end results. We'll show the house that's put together. We didn't show that really there were a bunch of missing parts, and we had to like wire tie it together and super glue it. Show the process with your kids. Um, show them you know, what happened and how you backed out of it and how you recovered. It doesn't have to be a physical thing like home repair, although that's a very rich vein of things like this. But like cooking, my cooking is all fail, so I can easily share that with my kids. Um, all right, the next one is owning technology starts with the technology at home. So uh, think about all the technology in your house. What technology do the kids in your house own? Own in the sense of they troubleshoot it. They figure out when it's not working. They patch it. They keep it running. They're, they are the people in charge of keeping that technology working. Sometimes it's not very much. Um, and so I have a story that goes with this. So when I was in third grade, uh, I told my dad I wanted a stereo. And I said, I, I really want, um, you know, all my friends had these cute little shelf units, and I wanted a stereo to listen to my awesome third grade music, whatever that was, like Rock Me Amadeus or Stray Cat Struts or, you know, all those amazing things. <laughs> and, um, and so I wanted a stereo, and my dad said, yeah, I'll get your stereo. And here's what he gave me, a stock of components and a box of wires. And I was like, hmm. It's not what I was picturing. Um, and I was like, OK, great. Can you go set it up? And he was like, you go set it up. And I was looked at him like, what? And he's like, yeah, go set it up. So I took the components back to my room. I took the box of wires. A stereo is not that complicated, right? There's not that many ins and outs, and most things are labeled. So I was able to figure it out, and I got it hooked up. I don't know why my dad did that, if he was like, really uh, amazingly observant, or if he was just tired that day, <laughs> didn't want to set it up. But 
it was, it was kind of magical because from the time that I did that, I knew how that stereo went together. I could take it apart. I could move it around my room. I could look for which wire was causing it to like sound funny. I could add new components. I owned that stereo and I took care of it and I could add to it. And even to this day, like I'll go try to help with the AV stuff if it's not working. So I had a lot of confidence around, I understand how this goes together and it's because I just did it on my own. But we have way cooler technology in our house now than stereos. We have all these things. We have Alexas, we have Playstations, we have our computers. Uh, I just got an IoT lock, we have thermostats. So I would say find something that your kids care about and let them be the sysadmin for it. So my older son, he's 12, he is the sysadmin for all gaming systems in our house. He's got the on-call for that. And when something goes wrong, that's his thing. Um, and he doesn't, he's not really very interested in the wireless network, but when the PlayStation doesn't work because it can't connect, he is interested in the wireless network. And so we have a conversation around how do you troubleshoot what's going on with the router and what are all these things that are happening. And so and it's been very powerful for him to kind of take control of that. We recently got one of these IoT locks. And um, he set it up himself. I gave it to him. He looked it up on the website. He put it in the door. He loves it. He unlocks it with his phone. Um, and it's great. But the only side effect is he's the admin for our house lock now. So that's, I probably need to update that. But this is a very powerful idea. So find the things that happen in your house. And I've had some great people from <laughs> these conferences give me some feedback. So here's a kid. His dad gave him a box of wires and a switch. Um, this other one was from uh, James Governor from Oktoberfest. And he said, I wanted to get my daughter her own computer. Now I'm really frustrated. And then later on, he sent me back. We got it working, and my daughter's like, it's my computer, which I definitely want to make a sticker that says, it's my computer for all the kids to have. Um, then there's some more. These were from DevOps days. So let your daughter fix the router day, which I think is a fantastic idea. Uh, this kid put together his own drum set. And then actually Ashley Roach, who was on stage with me earlier, he's doing a whole series around teaching my kids Linux, which is pretty cool. He has two daughters and has been experimenting with that. So I love to see this. If you guys try anything, please um, contact me on Twitter and let me see how your projects are coming together. All right, the next one, debate with your daughter. So this one's really important. You can debate about anything. Pick something that is passionate but not too sensitive. Like my dad and I would debate around Scrabble rules. Is P really worth this number of points, you know? And we would get into these heated debates. It can be about music, it can be about Star Wars predictions, you know, things like that. But debate, have a real debate, a real exchange, and listen to what she's saying. And what this helps with is if she chooses to go into STEM, at least for now, she's probably going to find herself as the only woman in a meeting at some time. And she's going to need to stand up for her ideas and her thoughts. She needs to be confident and comfortable doing that. And I really think that practicing that at home in a friendly environment really helps. My team might think that I practiced that a little too much. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I think it's really important. I think this woman in a meeting meme is ridiculous. I'd love to end it. But it's real. You, you know, you do see it. OK, this other one is, it's OK to break away from the pack. So this is where the encourage part comes in. Um, if Right now, if you're going to choose a technical field, you're probably making a choice that some of your other friends aren't making if you're a girl. And a lot of times in middle school, where this sort of pack mentality becomes really powerful and everyone's kind of doing the group think, that middle school time period is the also the same time when you might need to pick to go to a different summer camp or to take a different math class or to sign up for a different after school activity. And so I think having, knowing you have the support and knowing being encouraged to do that makes a tremendous difference at that particular point in time. So I love this definition of encourage, to inspirit, hearten, embolden, to mean to fill with courage or purpose, strength of purpose. And so if you have a, a daughter, a niece, a, a friend um, who is interested in STEM, please embolden her with that courage and strength of purpose to go ahead and, and try some of those things that are different. And the last one, this one's really hard. So you have to have that important and really uncomfortable and kind of awkward talk with your daughter about calculus. <laughs> so this is so important. <laughs> so if you take nothing away, this is, this is, this is really a, a really important one. So I recently read this study, and it says that women are one and a half times more likely to leave STEM after calculus as compared to men. And the lack of mathematical confidence is a suspected culprit. 
lack of mathematical competence? What does that mean? I didn't even, is mathematical competence a thing? Do you need confidence to do math? I, d I mean, you need it to maybe speak or do something, but so I started looking into it. It's a very, very real thing. Like there's documented studies that if you have confidence in your mathematical abilities, you perform better and it makes a big difference. And so this, I dove into this study a little bit more and I think there's some things that we can, we can do. So this, I know this is small, but I'll walk you through it. This is basically the drop off of girls and boys starting from fourth grade all the way until entering the STEM workforce. So in fourth grade, it's roughly equal. And then there's some drop off over um, as they make it into middle school. Then middle school, there's a very steep drop off and it's much steeper in girls. Boys stays, you know, relatively constant. Then there's a very steep drop off in both, although steeper for girls as they get from being a freshman in college and continuing on in the STEM majors. And then we continue on into the workforce. So if we look at that very steep drop off, this is really interesting. They surveyed all the people leaving Calculus 1 that did not continue to Calculus 2. So Calculus 2 is like required for most engineering computer science majors, right? And this red line, it says, I do, I'm, not con I'm not taking Calculus 2 because I do not believe, I do not believe I understand the ideas of Calculus 1 well enough to take Calculus 2. They didn't fail. They totally had grades high enough to go, but they chose not to because they didn't think they knew it well enough. And if you look at the statistics, only 14% of the STEM intending men chose that answer, but 35% of the, the STEM intending women chose that answer. And this is why they thought that the culprit for people not continuing was mathematical confidence. And this really struck me because I thought, um, oh, so they continued on. They said, what if we could change that? What if we could make those equal? If we could have the same um, rate of people continuing past calculus one, where does that put us? And that's this dotted line. And if we just shifted that one, that one point, then we would have women making up 30%, 37% of the entering STEM workforce um, versus 25. So that's a huge difference in people entering the STEM workforce from that one data point. It is a constraint on the system, right? So can we do something to move that constraint around this mathematical confidence? I think yes. Um, I think one of the things that we can do is have this awkward talk with your daughter. So I didn't have this problem with calculus. I liked calculus, but I think there were some reasons maybe why. We talked about calculus long before I got there. And my dad talked to me about it as um, it's a gateway. It's a gateway to majors that you may like. It's a gateway to careers that you may like. You may not like the class. It may be terrible. It may be hard. You may make a terrible grade. Um, you may not think it's relevant to everyday life. But it's an important class because right now, the way curriculums are set up, it is a gateway. So I went in prepared knowing that. And I think that made a tremendous difference. Um, and then the other thing is I, I've been recently having a lot of conversations about women that are freshmen, freshmen in college kind of going through this and parents. And one of the things that stands out is that a lot of times the female students will get an 80, a grade of an 80, which is completely passing and fine, right? But they feel very negative towards that grade of an 80, that they're not performing well, they don't understand it, they probably should stop, right? And the guys are kind of like, I got an 80, <laughs> I'm continuing on. <laughs> um, not to generalize too much, but that does seem to be a theme. And so I kind of dug into why. And so I think one of the reasons from the conversations I've had is that you're a freshman in college, you're away from your support structure, maybe you're in a major where there aren't a lot of other women, there's a lot of signals telling you maybe you shouldn't be there. And when you get um, a grade that's much worse than maybe what you got in high school, and you feel like it's not a good grade, it, it, it is amplified. The effect of that grade is amplified. And I've had w women tell me, I got fives on both AP calculus tests, but I never thought I was good at it. I've never, I haven't, I, I, so far, I haven't met a guy that said that. <laughs> so I think that there's like a different in perception in the way that that is it. So I would say, talk to your daughter, let her know calculus is important, and let them know that an 80 is fine, and then you're on to bigger and better things. One class should not determine your whole path, whether you can continue in STEM or not. There's many classes that make it up, so don't let that be a barrier. And then the other thing I think is we can share stories. How many of you had a hard math class that you felt stuck in in college? Everyone, right? <laughs> Do you talk about it? 
Not really, right? So share that story. And um, I've started a project called mathisnottheproblem.com. And if you would like to connect with me in ways that we can maybe talk about this, that we can share stories, that we can connect with college, um, you can go to that site. You can also just email me or Twitter me directly. But I am trying to gather collected people who are interested in working on this problem and think about what we can do locally within organizations that we're in, things like that. Um, so the specific ways, develop the engineering mindset, own the technology at home, debate with your daughter or niece or nephew or a friend, encourage them to break away from the pack if that aligns with their interest, and have the calculus talk. And uh, that's it. I think we're, we are going to wrap it up. My name is Mandy Whaley. You can find me on Twitter. I'd love to talk with any of you more about any of these topics. And thanks for listening. What do you guys think? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Oh, that's my computer. Oh, no, oh, it's okay. Yeah. So um, was that a good talk to include in DevNet Create? Yeah? Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. All right, so um, that wraps up our keynotes for day two. Uh, I want to, you know, let you all go out to lunch, so you can go and have lunch now. We have mini hacks all afternoon, awesome set of speakers continuing this afternoon. As we said, you get prizes for doing the mini hacks. Um, we actually have a link. Uh, I'll, we'll find a time to put it up later uh, for if you want to join the project opportunity. You know, so that we can actually be digging in and we'll have a way to contact you afterwards so we can create the community around that. Um, but thank you all. Have a great lunch and I will see you around this afternoon. <laughs>